many of you might have heard about the work of uh, Professor Bloch because of the Armadillo Vault, which he displayed in the 2016 Biennale. And I was there, was, it's a spectacular piece of architecture. It's still the show. Like it was, in my opinion, the, the most amazing piece there. Um, but before uh, Professor Bloch uh, shows his work, so um, Professor Bloch is a professor at the Institute of Technology and Architecture in ETH Zurich, where he co-directs the Bloch Research Group together with Dr. Tom van Mele. He is also director of the Swiss National Center of Competence in Research in Digital Fabrication and the founding partner of the Ochendorf, De Jong and Bloch ODB Engineering. Block studied architecture and structural engineering at the VUB in Belgium and at MIT USA, where he earned his PhD in 2009. Research at the Block Research Group focuses on equi equilibrium analysis, computational form finding, optimization, and construction of curved surface structures, specializing in unreinforced masonry vaults and concrete shells. So without further ado, um, Professor Block, thank you. All right, thanks, thanks for the, the, the introduction. Thank you for the, the invitation. So I have the dubious honor of being the last speaker today, but I hope that I will nonetheless uh, maybe bring you an input that uh, gives another perspective on, on BIM. Uh, I'm a bit nervous compared to typically because I will not only bombard you with a lot of images of uh, our projects, but actually show you how we develop these projects and how we kind of are trying to develop uh, not necessarily an alternative, but a complementary uh, kind of um, technology or approach that actually might complement BIM for more computationally engaged um, specialized projects. But first I want to start where all this fascination started for me. So lear learning from the master builders, uh, Guy actually gave a quite nice introduction to what I also very strongly uh, believe in. So here you're looking at these beautiful fan vaults at King's College. I actually uh, uh, did my PhD at MIT on the structural assessment of unreinforced masonry structures. And I want to take you on a very little tour to show how we can learn from that, but then also to show the importance of a fully integrated uh, computational design process that makes this possible, that this is now absolutely necessary. So you will see a lot of things that we heard already today will resonate, I think, I hope, in my talk. So what's special about these vaults is they, they have been standing for 500 years. They are about 10 centimeters thick, over 13 meter spans. So that means that these unreinforced stone vaults are literally as thin proportionally as an eggshell. So this is mind blowing. That means that somehow we have forgotten something, or we have lost some knowledge because I promise you, not many colleagues of mine, I'm both an architect and an engineer, would dare to sign off on a structure without any reinforcement that is so thin. Um, ways to explain these kind of geometries or uh, discover these geometries, as you all know, as hangs the flexible line, so but inverted will stand a rigid arch. It's very painful to make these uh, hanging models, so people developed graphical methods to discover these kind of forms. And what's specifically important about these graphical methods is that designers used to, indeed in the days that they were master builders, not just do a geometry, then analyze it, then build it, but actually immediately during analysis, actually be immediately aware between the relation between geometry and the forces in it. So yeah, this is the geometry. And this diagram actually literally represents the forces in the system. So you can measure the forces. So very explicit representation. They did this to compare a deep structure has globally lower forces than a more shallow structure for the same loading cases. No need for intuition. All of this is crystal clear because you see it. And so that is something that we believe in, that we want to develop methods that actually are not black box but are as white as possible. And so our response to BIM is also a whitening of the processes so that everything is accept, uh, accessible and so on. So let's start with this extremely boring design case. So you have a circular support and you want to span in compression. A dome, a dome with an opening. Well, in fact, there is infinite solutions that can span just in compression. And you will see why I care about compressive floors. Flow. So this butt shape to this alien-like thing to this Swiss cheese, all of this could be built with very little material or unreinforced. 
So here, uh, that is why we developed, this is a continuation of my PhD, tools that allow you to discover equilibrium forms by laying out where the forces want to go. And then this is the force diagram. Again, remember, you can just measure the magnitude of forces, and that allows you to discover all these different forms. I give this as an example, right? So that we are trying to give tools that give the designer actually all the knowledge as explicit and as clear as possible. So all these funky geometries all work, and you know exactly why as designer. They're also beautiful, so you see that you have these attraction of forces is indeed, you need to attract forces to have these rips and so on. So this, for, this is for compression shells. So I'll show you this in a quite extreme example that indeed we showed at the Venice Biennale, inspired by concrete shells of Heinz Isler, inspired by these beautiful droplet shapes by Fry Otto. We want to do something unique in the most extreme material possible because my colleague engineers are the most skeptical animals on the planet, so I had to go as extreme as possible. So what are we talking about? A stone vault, 16 meter spans, quite funky geometry, only five centimeters in the middle. There's no mortar, so dry connected. There's no reinforcement, there's no glue, there's no tricks. So this is beautiful geometry at play. And this is, by the way, knowledge that we have forgotten. So until a couple of years ago, no longer, my colleagues considered what we were developing appropriate to teach structures to architects. And what I want to show you in this talk is actually that we should care not only about integrating better, but also just designing better to save our planet. But we'll, get to, uh, we'll get there. So the Arsenale building, so we had these supports because we couldn't anchor anything, crazy site. And if you look at these numbers again, then when we return to our eggshell, this crazy shell was a third of the thickness proportional to the eggshell. If you already think that I'm absolutely bonkers, then perhaps this might also add to this. We had only five months to design, engineer, convince the Italians we were not absolutely crazy, fabricate and construct. As academics, we had developed these beautiful digital chains and pipelines and so on, so we were very confident we can handle it. Um, I was interested in the BIM class that the drawing was not allowed. I strongly believe that we still the connection between the hand and the drawing, and you need to put something meaningful in the computer to get something meaningful out, all right? So that is how it starts, but then we continue with digital sketching, but again, very explicit. This is all freely available. This is Rhino Vault. I'm very happy to say that by now 25,000 people use it, use it, including all the big engineering offices that you know. If they design a shell, or a famous guy like Achim Mens Menges, if he designs a shell, he will use a, a Rhino Vault. Right? That's important to me, that we actually share everything as open and as freely as possible. We do more advanced kind of things. We see when the stone under eccentricities would start spalling and then we use non-traditional engineering methods. So I will come back to this, but all of this is generated from one base model, from one base data information, right? And that is all these different custom solutions that are not standard in engineering are done. Okay, because the third step took a little bit longer than expected. The Italians were a little bit skeptical indeed that we could pull it off. So uh, that meant that we only had one month left for fabrication, 399 pieces, and that is not how we could have done it, uh, this. So this milling would have, we did the, the, the estimate, would have taken us two and a half years, so we would not even have made the next Biennale. So we went to these very efficient stone cutting machines, multi-axis, this is a diamond wire cutter, so this is a hot wire cutter for adults. And then uh, step number one to optimize the blanks, oops, sorry, the blanks would never be flipped because if you 3D mill, that is the, the part where you, the re-referencing and so on, where you lose time, tolerance issues and so on. The interface is done with the big blades, super fast, super efficient, big time saver, and then the inside was approximated with just a rough cut that we jumped one centimeter. You do this anyways in milling, right? You rough cut, you go past, then you go finer, finer, and then you polish at the end. And then we had Hector, one guy, that would hammer everything away. 
because we calculated that every stone in, in overall dimensions had to be within 0.4 millimeters of accuracy, or all these stones, this 3D puzzle would never come together, we did have a few custom profiling tools that actually shaved off these last few, uh, few kind of fractions of a millimeter. And then, uh, because through all this optimization, we lost our reference surface on the inside, we included these six millimeter registration marks that basically give the mason the right alignment of the stones. As engineers, that gave us the confidence that actually you would not have local sliding. After a full test assembly, which, we, which was interesting, interesting because we directly from our model sent, generated and sent the G-code to the fabrication, so to the machines. They just had to hit the button. They also never saw the geometry. We loaded all the data on their total stations and they started building. So this was very important to test this, not to embarrass ourselves in Venice and arriving um, not ready. So then in two and a half weeks, our colleagues, the Escobedos, could just uh, rebuild it in, uh, in this extremely constrained and technical kind of site. I also, yes, I, you will see that I am really, we're trying to push also the opportunities of bespoke prefabrication, so custom tailored prefabrication from new on-site kind of innovations, but I still believe that at the end of the day, the success comes from the craftsmen that really make it happen on-site. So getting ready, an earlier visit, maybe you recognize Lord Foster. He was probably thinking, damn, I want to be on this team. Uh, then uh, Alejandro Aravena misunderstood, and someone said you should see it from the top, but he started climbing it, which made me a little bit nervous, even though it was designed for outside uh, conditions, but we hadn't checked anything. But as you know, he's still alive, so um, <laughs> this went well. So it was there for five and a, uh, five and a half months, now it's in boxes, waited to be uh, 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 reassembled for the third time in a permanent location in a public party, park in Austin, Texas. What's neat about this is that what we try to show with this piece is really to start the other way around, to start from the constraint, uh, constraints, extreme constraints of budget, of time, of the limitations of the site and so on. And so you see that actually the peculiar aesthetic of the shell uh, is directly a result of the fabrication optimization. So you see the flat pieces on the inside, uh, the outside and the smooth surfaces on the inside. This gives you maybe a sense of really how thin it was. And also something that I didn't mention, also what, what, we, what I will show how we did this, is all the cuts are basically globally aligned to the force flow. So this is something that you cannot do, solve locally. This actually needs to come from an overarching computational strategy. You can stack things in many ways. And just why I show this is because if you s discretize structures smartly, then also something that looks like a box or the CCTV tower can become masonry. And this is relevant because in the next phase of the NCCR, we will actually develop strategies to assemble entire buildings, large scale buildings, without needing any support and logistics and scaffolding on site using the masonry model. That is also, by the way, what we used to design the memorial, the Collier Memorial on the MIT campus. Go touch it, it's beautiful. This was done by actually taking a volume and by smartly discretizing it, it became a structure. Because it's a beautiful arch, it will stand for a thousand years while the Frank Gehry building is leaking so much, it's not gonna last too long, anyway. Um, Caring about good form, designing differently, and I'll get to the computational aspects because nothing of what I'm showing is not possible uh, due to intense kind of control and integration of all these different considerations. This is tile vaulting, Mediterranean technique. You use a lightweight tile and a faceting mortar to build in stable sections, and then you, that first layer, you build up structural depth. Beautiful examples in New York City. So if you go to the Oyster Bar in Grand Central Terminal, you're not looking at just decoration. It's one of the three layers of an unreinforced tile vault that was built without any formwork. It was built basically in space. Very early project that I was uh, lucky to be involved, and I show this to make one point. That is, if you follow where the forces need to go, and that is maybe the key lesson, then either you can build extremely light or with very weak materials. So here for this project, by Peter Rich and John Oxendorf, I did the structural analysis of all the shells. 
Uh, we basically, they designed a, a, a brick, a soil press brick that can only take two megapascals in compression. So for the engineers, that makes sense. For the builders, for the architects, that means peanuts. Basically, really, really bad material. That is also, by the way, why the women are carrying the tiles, because week one was a total disaster. Half of the tiles were broken by the time they got on site when the men were just like not paying attention. So that is why the women were. Um, this, is, this is a true anecdote, by the way. But just to clarify that these tiles are basically only two megapascals in compression, but if you hold them on one end, they snap in bending. So very, very weak. Here you see the first laying going up. All of this timber here is actually guide work to make sure that we get to the right geometry because we are literally using unskilled laborers. <laughs> these are carpenters, farmers, these are not masons. So here you see the summary. Once you have boundary conditions, you can build in stable sections. But this to me is a very important image because this I use all the time to relate our innovations in our context to an experience that I had. A tile that would snap if you just hold it, if you place it in the right space, then it is strong enough for the next person to place and so on. Of course, a tension tie is very important. A curved geometry is a beam when you don't support it. Then you can get all these efficiencies out there. So this was for me an eye opener. This was still during my PhD and that is maybe what mostly kind of directed me in, in, in the direction of all this research. So done with local means, local labor and local uh, resources, 18 meter spans were the biggest fault, literally dirt cheap. We also use this for building uh, floor systems in Ethiopia and they're still using this system because it really uh, engages them. Maybe you've seen this as well, that is the fault that we built for Norman Foster and his foundation at the Venice Biennale. There's an, uh, an advantage of working with a star architect, it will be there for the next 10 years. So you can see it uh, uh, next time you visit the Biennale. Sometimes we also uh, have a little bit of fun. We were invited in New York City to do a pavilion that reflects on this earth. So we were thinking, what is earth in, in New York City? You have a lot of earth and labor available in Africa. In New York, you have a lot of waste. So why not, like our buddy Wally, compressing our material and then building something out of waste? So that's what we did. Uh, we used a super weak material, no binder, just compressed Tetra Pak. This is orange juice, this is milk. And so we basically, no surprise that this is again a little arch and this uh, nicely stood, was assembled super fast and so on. Uh, a more an example of parametric design. I showed this just to say that the message is strength through geometry and not through material capacity. But maybe a beautiful cathedral of waste for three days in New York. And then just because I, I got contacted that uh, people are doing mycelium here as well, the same colleague asked me, we use two megapascals in, New York, uh, in, in Africa, we use something with absolutely no structural capacities recycled in New York. Why not growing your materials? So we used mushroom. And this is, uh, the mushroom has only 0.2 megapascals in compression. So remember peanuts. So this is 10 times worse than peanuts. And because I was getting annoyed that everyone called me the arch guy, I thought let's show a three-dimensional arch. And for this we actually, this is based on research where we reinvented graphic statics to do full 3D exploration of structures. Basically these, these polyhedra have something to do with the equilibrium of the forces in the system and that allows you to discover these forms. So it's still sta standing there in Seoul, Korea. So this is a tree entirely done in, 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 in mushrooms. Actually what's maybe interesting here is that the specific challenge here was actually to develop a kit of parts. This was built, the, the pieces were grown in Indonesia. And so we basically made the geometry control the mold such that it could be fabricated with any type of materials that they found. So it was independent of thickness. Anyway, all right, now the key thing is how can we learn from these kind of uh, examples? Okay, I, uh, I, I showed funky mushroom trees, I showed uh, buildings in Africa. Everyone knows that you can build in earth in, with arches in Africa. What's the relevance for our situation? So uh, this is a research platform where innovations, uh, research innovations are being invited and it's missing its beautiful crown on top. This is the nest building on EMPA. And this is what is now uh, in, uh, in final uh, development and will start construction in uh, 
uh, January 2019. So why am I showing this? Is because this is where we will, and it's already entirely engineered and approved, so we got building permits. The floor system will basically be a reinvention of what I showed you there. So an arch, very good geometry for uh, a certain loading case, not for a point load. The force lines wants to exit. So if you add stiffeners and then you add a tension tie, what I basically did is an extremely lightweight version of a beam, of a floor plate. And so that is indeed what we did. So we connected something that we know works in Africa. Can we use this for our context? Can we actually use this efficiency of compression to, find this floor, uh, to develop a new floor system? And actually, just by doing this move, I haven't even talked about optimization yet, you save more than 70% of material. And this is, by the way, for a floor plate, this is compared to a hollow core pre-stressed concrete floor. So 70% liar, right? So for the project in, in Nest, we are building a, a six by four meter floor plate with two centimeters of unreinforced concrete. The trick is that we separate compression and tension, that we externalize the tension ties. Nothing new about this. This is what people used to know how to do, how to engineer. Still, a lot of skepticism, what the heck are you talking about? So we need to do all the load tests, so we demonstrate that it takes 10 times the required ULS and so on. And then when you crack the floor, you see the beauty of its thinness and so on. The, the, the shell, I like shell structures. This is a Pringle carrying 500 times its self-weight. You don't see too many curved surface structures in concrete, only for unique projects like the Rolex Center because they need a unique budget. The unique budget typically goes to this. Logistics, building up, building a foundation, scaffolding, months of carpentry, milling of, of foam that all after 28 days will return into this. This is actually a picture of the Rolex. Center. We thought that was silly, so we developed a flexible forming system with cable nets and fabric. And then as structural nerds, you need to stand on that. I still cannot believe that based on this little model, we convinced the client that we could do it for a shape of 10 meters by 20 meters by seven and a half, but here we are. So this is the actual structure that you then look at. By the way, we also solved acoustics, something that no one uses actually in the built industry, but they use it in airplanes. That is to use structural stiffness rather than mass, because how silly would it be? You have an elegant structural form, because of contact noises, you add your, your screed to basically uh, acoustically dampen. Not necessary, we showed it both computationally and through uh, experimental full-scale testing in acoustic labs. Also now, suddenly, and that is actually why I showed these projects first, because you see that here, in these kind of approaches, there cannot be a separation. The building systems, the heating, cooling, the air, air ducts and so on cannot come later. So all of that needs to basically be taken into the design. So indeed with my colleagues in building systems, uh, Arno Schluter, we're including a low temperature heating and cooling system. So it gets cold in Switzerland and actually you only need, in the worst case, 35 degrees, which is just the waste heat of the appliances, to activate this large structural surface that serves as a, a heating cooling exchanger. All right, and then on top of that, we have thin film <laughs> photovoltaics. This project is a little bit of overkill of everything, but it will be a nice demonstration of these ideas. Okay, I said that the client got convinced, got convinced until it got really real, and then they said, ah, we don't believe that you can pull it off. So they asked for a full scale prototype mock-up of the roof. This is our new building, robotically fabricated hull, cool in the bottom, even cooler. We have 40, by 40 meters by 70 meters by four and a half meters. Crazy robotic space to do all kinds of uh, uh, robotic prototyping. So I saw a chance when the building opened and I locked two thirds of the hull with a project that had nothing to do for, uh, with robotics. So to actually demonstrate the concept, can we just have a pre-stressed cable net with the fabric so that you don't have to support it from below? Extremely lightweight to do this. Again, the sizes we are talking about is 10 meters by 20 meters by seven, seven and a half meters in bounding box. So here this is, and perhaps I'm lucky, I'm still, I'm still uh, paying this money back somehow or trying to. We took the risk to do all of this because this would be really 
a very extreme innovation to do this all with uh, industry partners that would build the real shell. So that meant that we went step by step and tested everything. So that is something that we had to do for industry adoption of such a kind of crazy sounding thing. So there we go. We developed this kit of parts. It's obvious that all of this is labeled, all of this and so on. This all comes together. So here, these pieces you will see in the models later are automatically generated, of course. And then here, uh, this. Maybe you might think this still looks quite academic, but can I compare this to the months of carpentry, the months of milling and wasted material, all the scaffolding that you will need? So a week of three people assembling a mechano or a kit of parts is kind of okay. Uh, this was already set, BIM, BIM on site, so that is uh, how that looks. Um, this money shot maybe clarifies why we did this, right? Um, this is the cable net. The cable net weighs only 500 kilograms, the fabric 300 kilograms. So with 800 kilograms of material, we carry 20 tons of wet concrete. So this is a nice, a nice relation. Plus, because this really was a one-to-one -one test, now this thing is in four pieces. We will stitch it together and we build the next one immediately because we just need to hoist it in place and reattach it. Okay. I didn't say everything. In order to go from stiff, we know exactly where everything is, to a flexible formwork, you need to add something to it. So we developed algorithms that can give you a non-uniform pre-stress so that under the weight of the concrete, it hits exactly the right shell. Sounds great. We got paper prize for this. Um, no, has nothing to do with reality. Because over these spans, if you're a millimeter off, if any of these cables are wrong, if any of these connections move a little bit differently than you simulated, then your cable net will move entirely differently. So we developed control algorithms that actually allow you to measure the state. And then what? You have 90 trillion combinations of how to tighten, loosen, and so on. So which is the one that gets you there? So that we solve things through beautiful mathematics. So we implemented this, and then we felt uh, Good. This is how it looks like from the bottom, from the top. Another nice thing, which you can really check and simulate all in advance, is these crazy geometries become suddenly extremely simple when you plan for it. Because these nodes were designed such that you could just very simply screw on these space holders for these doubly curved uh, kind of reinforcement mats. This is a car <laughs> carbon fiber reinforced uh, strategy. A lot of concrete magic to basically be able to vibrate on entirely vertical surfaces. There we went to testing. The concrete is not 100%, but because we did this with our partners step by step, there is, so basically we did a physical uh, BIM 4D simulation, I guess. And uh, we basically know everything that uh, will happen, and they all signed uh, that uh, this next time will be done in just 10 weeks. So there it was. Ah, what I didn't say is it was kind of important to stick to the geometry because not only for construction tolerances, you need to hit a certain target. So we are everyone, everywhere within a centimeter of, of, of precision, which, was, uh, which is more uh, better than what is necessary. But more importantly, the shell is only three centimeters uh, at the end, five centimeters in 85% of the shell and then it goes to support. So it needs to be really spot on. And that is also why we did it so thin, to show that indeed we not only control it, we had to control it because otherwise this thing would have collapsed, right? Okay, there it was. How am I doing? Uh, actually, how am I doing on time? Okay. So. <laughs> Maybe something that you noticed is that on site, still great, lightweight, cool. But there is still a lot of logistics on site and also a lot of kind of correcting on site, which is challenging, unpredictable environments and so on. So now I'll show you what for us is the next step. We, this was our dear machine, which Mariana, uh, my PhD student, called Grandmother. This is a hacked machine from the 90s to basically a test 3D knitting of technical textiles. What's cool about uh, 3D knitting is that non-orientable surfaces, for example, can be knit without any stitches, any cutting patterns. So all of this comes out in one go. You can include T-sections, 
very hard to realize in prefabrication. You can include tubes, you can include reinfor continuous reinforcement strands, and so on and so on. So for this, we basically had to understand the knit locally to then have an entire computational process to basically generate, at the end, the knitting pattern, feed it to the machine, shortcut all manual techniques. It's crazy that all of this is being done manually. You just feed it, and it comes out, right? So for example, for the note that I will show next, this is then uh, the, the different short rows and the different operations that need to happen. And this is actually why we do this. This is the knit textile, bespoke prefabrication, super controlled. You can test it, everything works, you can simulate it. And then we stiffen this with a high strength uh, concrete cement paste. And that then gives you an extremely lightweight stay in place formwork piece. So this is a specific geometry, right? But so imagine that this can now be very easily rather than building all these formworks around. So we did this then on a little bridge as a test. So here another advantage of knitting, you can include all kinds of features that are relevant. So here to have a self-stable supporting frame. And this weighs only 400 grams. So the little bridge, two meter span of concrete is built on something that is stable by itself that weighs only 400 grams. There you see it. Again, magic concrete. This is then self-supporting stiff enough. And one of the two floors of four by six meters in the Hilo project will be built, built with such a stay-in-place formwork. And I already am looking forward to the money shot of Mayana and one colleague walking on site with a six-meter floor and just carrying it, right? So that is something that uh, will be quite cool, I think. This is Mariana and her happy colleague. And the next step, so in the next phase of the NCCR, we will also include all the reinforcement in the same knit. Why the knit? So here I showed as a stay-in-place formwork. But if you don't use it for prefabrication, you can bundle it together, literally take it in your backpack, and go tighten it as you want, and so that is the, the vision, the next step. All right, this is actually, that is why it's with quote, quotation marks. This is actually what our colleagues, big engineering firm, Bollinger Groman, one of the partners called our approach BIM on steroids. So suddenly I was like, ah, maybe I can say something about BIM, even though I didn't realize we were doing BIM. So let's see. So we developed Compass. Compass is an open source, um, so entirely free platform, uh, computational platform. Uh, software, in, uh, software independent, platform independent, entirely robust, never breaks. I promise you, we tested this already with many people. What is special about it, I'll show you through this, through this project quickly how we approach this. So basically, all these different custom features, that is why I'm saying it's not necessarily attacking or proposing something different than BIM. It's actually providing a BIM for extremely complex uh, geometries that on top need some interventions, adaptions, and kind of new processes on site, for example. So this computer vision, active control, the digital fabrication, the construction, so the entire simulation of the formwork assembly and the tightening schemes, the structural engineering, all of that was basically controlled by extremely lightweight data. So we have been talking about clashing, about interface dete uh, um, no, problem detection and so on. This is not possible when you approach a project like this. OK, so that means that Rhino geometry becomes a custom form finding tool. Um, the FE uh, mesh, uh, this is done in Sophistic, is automatically generated. By the way, when we measure our geometries and we run our control algorithm, we need to map the point cloud to the new geometry, right? That would take a typical engineering firm a week to reset and to re-import, to re tessellate and so on. So all of that was done literally in an instance, right? So this is what it takes. Also, the geometry got um, uh, had these kind of things, you know. But what's neat about uh, the framework is that um, the entire main library is basically offered for free and basically gives any researcher, any collaborator, no dependencies between pro uh, projects. So that is why we actually developed it. Because every single PhD student is reinventing the wheel. Every single office is reinventing the wheel by making their own custom kind of connections. So here, Rhino Geometry is for free, sophistic, abacus, um, 
which one else? Uh, ANSYS or OpenSys geometry. So you don't need to transfer. We did it for you, right? So these kind of things. If you want to run custom MATLAB code or optimization strategies, you don't have to interface anything. You get all of this for free. So it is, uh, and a key thing is also we develop these very flexible data structures which are needed to actually keep track of things. All right, so data structures, uh, we have networks. I will show you that these are very useful meshes, of course, and then volumetric meshes. And then with the interfaces, so this, uh, ah, uh, maybe thing uh, is that uh, uh, Autodesk is getting very excited about this and paying us to also make an interface to uh, Revit, obviously. So actually, this is an example. So how this thing works, so if you are computational, you can actually, whatever you implement, works in whatever software. The only thing you need to change is basically where you import the, the, the uh, uh, where you import the different uh, uh, data structures from, right? So there's data structures for all these different interfaces. So suddenly, Rhino can become an extremely flexible uh, Maya-like modeling environment. This is, by the way, done. This is a sample on the code. We see the framework also is teaching people uh, how to do research or computational methods. This example is shown. This is just done in one afternoon. You can combine different things, and you have a very advanced modeling interface. This is an example of this remeshing. So this is something I have two postdocs in structural mechanics, and they have basically abstracted out all the engineering specific things so that you can basically freely design, interface, and optimize your structures. Then some add-ons. Uh, the most popular one is that is also the first package released is the, uh, is the open source uh, finite element package. So that Rhino geometry is directly FE geometry. So you don't have to go over Grasshopper, Caramba, all these different connections for free. Uh, by the way, and you see all the results in your, in your design, right? Networks are uh, um, uh, non-procedural graphic statics. So doing any type of these master builder equ equations that uses the network. The knitting is also an application of the network. We also do complex assemblies. So this we had to do to generate our structural models for our unreinforced masonry. That is actually a combination between meshes to actually find the collision and the interfaces between pieces, and then a data structure, very simple data structure. This graph tells you everything you need to know. It gives you your reference frame, it gives you your contact properties, it gives you all, and so on and so on. So this is entirely robustly implemented. I have to admit, this is mainly for researchers, right? So that we have a computational glue to start to talk and not to have to each try to match your own research uh, kind of condition. The 3D graphic statics, also done. So basically, for my researchers, I wanted to address this. This is absolutely not reproducible. So researchers, if you give this to your next PhD student, no chance. He or she will have to redo everything. So the advantage of Compass is that everything you build as an extension to Compass is compatible with each other. So we are sharing everything we do. So everything I showed, soon you will see the solvers, all the methods available online. And more importantly, the next phase of the NCCR, which are roboticists, computer graphics, material scientists, and so on. All of these PIs have committed to use for all collaborations in the NCCR Compass. So we are trying to actually provide this framework of and this is just maybe a bit provocative, but I thought it was interesting. A colleague of mine, an expert in BIM, sent me this diagram. And now, after the long day and also this morning, I noticed information loss, information loss, information loss. You better coordinate the testimony this morning. Stop, no more changes to the geometry. I'm doing the structure. Please don't change anything. And you need to, at a certain point, do it in the, so you better coordinate. You need to coordinate between uh, your Revit model and what they're doing in the shop, because they're disconnected and so on. And my colleague then proposed actually indeed that, well, because that is actually the trick, is that we're using Rhino, Blender, Revit, uh, Maya. We're using it as an interface. The geometry exists by itself using extremely lightweight standards like JSON 
that are of course used in internet applications because you want to allow these kind of uh, applications. So this is what we use and what works of course extremely smoothly because there's never any clashes because everything comes directly from your core data. So this is Compass. As I said, it's, it's released and there is many release cycles coming on and all these projects have been done like that. Okay, can I make one closing statement? All right, so the, the Biennale project. So most people were looking at this, like you might have seen this, it was beautiful, I'm very proud of it. What we tried to show there is basically to start from bottom up, but also to, to show that actually uh, these uh, caring about geometry actually matters, that you can bring, uh, so we wanted people to stop and to listen to our story. But these methods are even more important, how to discover this form, and then there was maybe, you have seen this story of the little floor systems. So starting from, his, from history, learning from the master builders, <laughs> providing a solution from, for Africa that, can, that they can really build with local resources, highly, highly efficient systems that suddenly make their, their living cost affordable. But then also the extremely thin floor systems that we use. This is, by the way, a structural model. This is way too heavy. You can pierce this wherever. Uh, you can make all these like interfaces. And I don't have it. I only have it in sketches. But you will see when it gets built. Or in fact, in May, we will have a full-scale prototype. We actually have also full integration of building systems. Everything that you need in there. Okay, but it's expensive at the time, certainly. Now we're way, way further, but at the time it was very expensive to make because unfortunately, and this is where we then come to digital fabrication, is unfortunately structural geometry is complex ge geometry, mean, means expensive to make. So this we made with a very expensive double-sided mold. Only makes sense when you can have repeated units. Okay, maybe something cheeky, maybe for the army. So they have repeated kind of uh, uh, repeated uh, buildings that they make. But for real projects, you need to be able to be bespoke, not only because of, for example, floor plan, but also for different boundary conditions, different HVAC requirements, different and so on and so on. So that is why we also showed the last floor. This is a fully 3D printed floor. This is actually using sand printing. And what's actually funny is that the material is almost identical, uh, identical to the one that I described in Africa. So peanuts in compression, and it breaks as easily as, uh, as cold dark chocolate. So this has, this has a material properly, property equivalent to dark chocolate. What's nice about this now uh, digital fabrication coming to construction scale is that you can, you basically have geometry for free, no more molds needed and so on. So we tested also this floor with these materials. So basically peanuts in compression and no bending capacity and it satisfied the building codes. If you don't believe me, this is half of my group. So one and a half tons of ETH nerds standing on just a two centimeter floor. And this is now where I want to make a statement. Two centimeter floor, you might still, now that you saw my lecture, you might still not want to enter any of the projects that I design. I understand. But isn't it crazy? Something that I didn't say about this beautiful shell is that it's not only self-supporting, it's not only built without formwork, it's also carrying the Vanderbilt hull on top. That means, and proportionally, this is much thinner than my two centimeters. That means that two to three million New Yorkers a day are severely risking their lives. So I think this is crazy. That is why I started by, I think we forgot something or we lost some knowledge. These kind of elegant structures. Can you imagine the impact in a high rise, right? 70% just on the floor. Recent research has shown that of the three quarters of the weight of a building goes to the construction, just holding itself up, the rest is cladding and whatever. And if you go to relevant floor spans, spans, look at the contribution of the slab with respect to the column. So if you can do something about the floors, then you solve everything. Certainly, if you kind of um, uh, go high, and then indeed, we will demonstrate as well, I didn't show you the details of that, but we all know the layering of all these systems and the inefficiencies that come uh, with that, so 
Only with a truly integrated design we can improve that. And we will show in the nest a system that standard, state of the art, needs one and a half meters. We will basically fit it in 40 centimeters because we have the cavities where structure used to be to basically reinvent also building systems. And then for me, um, I hope I convinced you about maybe an even more extreme approach of uh, in the early design stage, true computation combines structure, integration, and fabrication that you can elegantly build this as well. But for me, at the end of the day, this makes me happy that, structure, that beautiful structures are indeed also uh, perhaps aesthetically pleasing. And then we have some nice books. Doesn't matter. I took enough time. Uh, thank you for your attention.